بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الله رب اشرح لي الله مفتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله في كل لمحة ونفس عدد ما وسيعه علم الله يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تآخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صبري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يثقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم um, Before we begin um, First of all, I'm very honored that you came back I see that there's some new faces and uh, you're all welcome here um, You know, this class that we have is meant to be for you. So this is meant to benefit you. It is not my purpose to talk and uh, or to use big words or to show you that I know this if I do know it. Okay? The purpose is that you understand it and that you can internalize it and that you can own it. And so for that reason uh, it's very important that we sort of keep in touch with each other as we go. So, for example, I understand from yesterday's lecture that some of the words that I used were not understood. And um, I didn't have any idea that would be the case. When I came to Egypt 40 years ago, very few people here spoke e English. And I remember people didn't want to speak Arabic with me, they wanted to speak English because they wanted to practice English. But so many of you uh, now speak English so well, you speak it with an American accent or a British accent, that I assume that you understand everything that I say. So if that's not the case, then I want you to raise the, your hand and say, I didn't understand that word. So for example, we use the word cognitive frame. And I understand that there's some people who don't know what the word cognitive means. So you feel free to ask because it's very important that we understand each other, right? And you know, cognitive frames are thinking frames. They are the frameworks that we have in our mind that enable us to think. Sometimes they make it possible for us to think what is correct and sometimes they make it impossible for us to think what is correct. For example, yesterday we talked about the cognitive frame, primitive. We say this is a primitive religion. Okay, so that cognitive frame, as we said yesterday, is a Darwinian idea that early human beings necessarily were backward and rudimentary and they understood very little. Okay, so we have to be very careful about using that word because we may not agree with that cognitive frame. I don't at all. I don't agree with that cognitive frame. And uh, so cognitive then pertains to cognition. Cognition is the way we think. A cognitive frame is a itar, you know, it is a mafhum, you know, that underlies the way that we order our thought. Um, also, we talked about thermodynamics, and uh, thermodynamics is the study of the dynamic, you know, or the, the behavior of heat. Thermo is from heat. Okay, so thermodynamics is the study of the way that heat behaves. And we'll come back to talk about that a little bit tonight. And what was the other word? If you don't mind my asking you. Cognitive frames, thermodynamics. There's another really basic word. That... In any case, tonight as we speak, 
um, you know, when you have questions that require elaboration, then I prefer that we have those at the end, like we did last night. Okay, but if I say a word that you don't understand, please, please ask me. Okay, I don't want to, I want you to understand. And I'm not here to bewilder you with big words. We're here to use words that are meaningful to you. And uh, maybe we can help you build your beautiful vocabulary. You have good vocabulary already. But um, it's, it, the most important thing is that I am able to communicate to you. You know, there's no point whatsoever in my pontificating. Does anybody have to know what that word means? <laughs> you know, my sitting at this table like a pope, that's pontificating, you know, and declaring this is true and this is false. There's no purpose in that. But what we want to do is to think together. And it's very important that you're able to follow my thoughts. As we said before, some of you have studied Aqidah, uh, some of you are students in Al-Azhar. Uh, others of you have never studied it before. So this puts people that have never studied it before at a disadvantage. And I don't want you to be at a disadvantage. Okay? I want you to be at home here. And um, sometimes these ideas, when we hear them for the first time, they are difficult to assimilate. Okay? That's just the way that human thought works, you know, that, um, you know, so we have to be very patient, you know, and we have to listen carefully, and then, inshallah, all of this is being recorded, uh, all of it you'll be able to download, and if you have the time, you can listen to it again, but uh, these things usually, they become very clear, extremely clear, but in the beginning, don't expect them to be that way. Um, I remember when I began to study this uh, a long time ago, I had questions about the most fundamental things. And sometimes my teachers were amazed, like, you don't understand that? You know, and particularly about the way that reason works. To me, a lot of that was very new, because coming from a Western background, Empirical science was everything. Empiricism, which is, you know, when we derive our knowledge from what we can see, hear, touch, taste, and smell, that was everything. And we never used reason outside of the realm of mathematics or geometry. We didn't use reason to talk about the nature of finitude and how the infinite points to the, how the finite points to the infinite, right? So I had lots of questions about reason, and even one of my sheikhs, it's like, he said, I thought you Americans were advanced people. How can you ask a question like that? And I told him that, that we don't use reason, we don't cultivate reason. We're not familiar with it. Okay, and I had to work on that a long time. So, inshallah, we ask Allah to enable us to understand, you know, to open our hearts and you know, to enable you to follow what I'm saying and to understand it better than I understand it. And to be able to teach it yourself. Because that, that's what we want when we talk about a poem like this. We want you to be able to understand this. And you to be able to uh, read it and comprehend it. And for you to be able also to teach it to others. And also to defend it. Um, because of the fact that often we have to do that in life. In the United States and in Canada, and I don't, I assume that this is probably also true in Egypt, um, many students when they go to the university are asked, why do you believe in God? And they are even directed to write essays on why I believe in God or don't believe in God. And many of our Muslim students who go to American universities and colleges don't know how to answer that question because of the fact that they were never taught theology. 
They were never taught to think. They were only taught that these are obligations, these are duties. You must believe this, you cannot believe this. This is right, this is wrong. You have to do this, you can't do that. But when the religion is just a list of do's and don'ts, and those do's and don'ts also include what we believe about God and what we believe about the Prophet, that's not very convincing. And often they will fail. Professors say, you don't know what you're talking about. That you have no basis for belief in God whatsoever. And this is a big test for a lot of Muslims in the United States and in Canada. And it reflects a very unfortunate failure, which is the fact that usually when we teach Islam today, we don't teach theology. It's just wudu, salat, fasting, hajj, zakat, buying and selling, maybe, maybe a few other things as well. Do's and don'ts. Okay, but as we said yesterday, the first obligation of Islam is to understand the theology. And that means the first obligation of Islam is to think, to be able to think, to be able to look at the book of creation and to read it. And most people today are illiterate when it comes to that. Even great Western thinkers, great professors, great academicians, but if you ask them to look at the world and to tell you the meaning of the world, it's the book. It's a kitab also. They can't read that book. Okay, they are illiterate. They don't know how to make sense of it. And this is what the aqidah is doing. It's trying to give us that ability bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. So I'd like you to feel free and um, especially if I say something you don't understand, please ask. Okay, what does that word mean? What did you just say? And then we'll go back and you can be sure if you don't understand it, there are 10 other people who don't understand it. Maybe 20. Okay, so um, feel free to do that. The big questions, inshallah, we'll try to take at the end like we did last time. So yesterday we treated two issues of aqidah. We talked about many things and I hope that you will pardon me, sometimes I talk about all sorts of things that are not relevant, not directly relevant, you know, like the ancient nature of the Arabic language. I love the Arabic language. Arabic language is incredible. It stands by itself among world languages. Um, but the Aqidah issues that we talked about were really two. And those were creation from nothing and preeminence of the Prophets. Okay, these, these were the two Aqidas that we talked about. We talked at considerable length about the first one, that we believe as the ancient Prophets and Messengers and the Jews and the ancient Christians believe that God created the world from nothing, that God existed and his existence is real. His existence is everything. His existence is full. And God created the world at will. That is an ancient, prophetic, Judaic, Christian, and Islamic belief that God creates from nothing. Kan Allahu wa la shay'a ma'ahu. That God existed. God was, and there was with him nothing. There was no energy, there was no matter, there was no light, there was no throne, there were no angels, there were no prophets, there was nothing. There was just God himself. Can Allahu, in his perfection, in his fullness, there is no imperfection or incompleteness in that reality. That he is al-haqq, he is al-mutahaqqiq, wujuduhu, in everything. He is the one whose existence is fully realized in and of itself. Okay? And then he creates the world. He creates the world in time and place. And he creates it as an act of knowledge, will, and power. 
He creates matter, he creates the atom, and we talked yesterday about how miraculous the atom is. You know, that this particle that theoretically we believe to be the basic unit of material reality is really beyond comprehension. As we said yesterday, the electron goes around the nucleus 10 billion times in one millionth of a second. I mean, this is absolutely uh, bewildering, right? And Imam al-Haddad, may Allah be pleased with him, he says that the disbeliever is bewildered by creation. And there are many great scientists that when they look at creation, they talk about the atom, they talk about the particles of the atom, they talk about the universe and its vastness. They can't believe in God because there couldn't be a person who did this. It's like they cannot imagine a God who is great enough to create this universe. For, for them, the universe is Akbar. Okay? That's as far as they can go. And um, some scholars, you know, are, you know, like Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya used to tell me about certain astronomers that he knew that that was really their position that like there's just no way that my mind can fathom that there could be a being who is great enough to create this perfect world so yatahayaruna fil khalq they are bewildered by creation and imam al haddad says wal mu'min yatahayaru fillah you know that the believer is bewildered by god and um Imam al-Sha'rawi here in Egypt, I heard him speak years ago when he first came to the United States. He actually gave a speech which was about that. That how, you know, we, we have the ability to understand everything in the physical world. But God is that reality, the essence of which we can never comprehend. And if we do any justice to theology in the study of theology, it will wake us up so that we can see how marvelous this world is that is in front of us, this world in which we live. Okay, so, um, you know, the atom itself is an amazing thing. How can this exist? I mean, you have a fan. If your fan were to go uh, a thousand circuits in a second, it'd probably break. I mean, how can this atom exist for a single second? 10 billion circuits, the fan is going around 10 billion times in one millionth of a second. How can it exist for a second and not fall apart? This is, as our scholars say, ayatun min ayati qahrillahi ta'ala. He is al-qahar. And creation is a manifestation of qahar. That God compels it to exist. God holds it into existence. And this atom is empty because all the weight is in that tiny little nucleus surrounded by this huge field of the electron, which as we said yesterday, if we made a real model of the atom, the nucleus would be as big as my fist or as big as a tennis ball. And the circuit of the electron would be two football fields. It's empty, there's nothing there. It's non-existent, it's atom. It's just that because of this little point that is going around the nucleus so quickly that it's got solidity. You know, that's why they say also that in terms of probability, I could put my hand through this microscope, uh, through this microphone. It just requires the proper alignment of the atoms. I could just put it through because it's mostly empty. That's not likely to happen. You know, and it would be a miraculous thing if it did happen. But if we understand the nature of the atoms, it's just a matter of probability whether I could actually put my hand through this or not. It just needs the right alignment of atoms. Because these atoms are empty. They are Adam. They are Adamat. And, um, you know, so then we talked also about the second law of the science of thermodynamics. And as we said, thermodynamics is from thermo, which means heat. You have thermal clothing, for example. 
and dynamics, which is the study of the behavior of things, the dynamic of their behavior. So thermodynamics is a science about the way that heat behaves in the physical universe. And it pertains to things like physical heat, gases, and electricity. And it's a very, very important science because of the fact that the world that we know um, is very much the function of the realities of thermodynamics. So, you know, as we said, you know, if we have a cold bathtub of water and we put a hot iron into it, um, the heat in the iron will distribute in the water so that after a while it will all be one temperature. Okay, so thermodynamics, this is the second law of it, the leveling of energy. And we also call that equilibrium, which means balance. Okay, so this is the way, it's a, a one-way street. In terms of what we know about the physical universe, heat goes to cold. It distributes. And therefore, from the time that this was understood, and it was understood a long time before the science of thermodynamics was made a science, which was in the 19th century, uh, then great scientists who understood it, like Newton, they said, this is the proof of God. This is the proof that God created the world and that the world has a beginning that is not eternal. Okay, now do you understand what the logic is there? The logic is that for the distribution of heat, for heat to level, to, for it to become balanced, it's just a matter of time. It needs time. If the world were eternal and it didn't have a beginning, then you have all the time you need. So therefore, there should be no lights, there should be no hot things and cold things, there should be gases should be diffused. You know, everything that holds together this world would be finished. Everything would be balanced. Even this table would crumble. Even the wood of this would fall. Um, you know, everything would be the same matter. There wouldn't be any trees outside. There wouldn't be any mountains or hills. Everything would be the same. And that's not the case. The multiplicity of the world, the kethra, you know, of things in this world, that shows us that that's not the case at all. So, therefore, the world must have a beginning Okay, this is the most basic proof of thermodynamics. Okay, and we could probably talk about other things from it as well. And then the other thing that we talked about was the um, expansion theory of the universe. Okay, which you probably know as Big Bang, because that's the way it's been popularly named, and I, I don't like that name at all, because that... You know, it is a metaphysical intrusion. <laughs> you know, the scientists who say that, they say no metaphysical intrusions. They mean by that, we don't want you to make any statements about the unseen. Metaphysics, physics is the physical world. Okay, physics is the physical world. And the science of physics is the science of matter, right? Um, metaphysics means above physics. So metaphysics is the world that is above the physical world and that explains it. So always in metaphysics, the first proposition is the existence of God. Okay, but in Big Bang Theory, great scientists will say, don't tell us about creation from nothing. It's like, you just showed me creation from nothing. You just took me to the door. They said, don't talk about that. Don't open that door. We will have no metaphysical intrusions in physics. But then he calls it Big Bang. And that's a metaphysical intrusion. Do you see that? Because he's saying that what actually happened? Well, it was chaos. It was random. It was an explosion. Like, you don't have any more right to say that than I have a right to say that God created the world from nothing. And in doing it, 
He is the best of creators. So it wasn't chaotic. There may have been sound, but that sound could have been very beautiful. And there was no chaos. There was order. And that's a metaphysical intrusion. But we have a right to do that. We can interpret the information that way, just as they interpret it in another way if they want. Okay, um, so this is very important. And the expansion theory of the universe, which comes from the study of the stars, it shows that this universe, which is so huge, which we live in, is expanding rapidly in all directions, equally. And therefore, it began at a certain point. Because everything is equidistant from that point. Okay? So this is the theory of the point universe. A universe that arose from a single point. A dot. Which is nothing. Which is nothing. Or, you know, uh, you can call it the expanding universe theory. The point universe theory or the expanding universe theory. Again, Big Bang, I don't accept that because that's a cognitive frame. That's not, if you say expanding universe, you're just describing to me what you saw. That's not a cognitive frame. If you say point universe, that's okay because you're just describing to me what you arrived at. But when you say Big Bang, no, now you're interpreting how this happened. And you have no right to do that. Unless you use the proper metaphysical rules and if you have some, I have some too. So if you want to talk about that, I would like to talk about it as well, from a theological standpoint. Okay, so this theory also shows that this world and everything in this world, the earth, the stars, the planets, that they all began at a certain time. They did not exist. There was no energy, there was no matter. There was nothing. And then they exist like that. And we talked yesterday about the six days of creation, um, you know, which we're not going to go into, but in the theory of the expanding universe, you also have six stages. You have six stages. One, two, three, four, five, six, which is interesting. And some of our scholars, like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, may Allah bless him and protect him, have spoken about that very eloquently. Okay, so <clears throat> these are empirical, scientific findings of our time that really open up the veil of the unseen. You know, one of the things we'll see in, philosophy, in theology is that all of these things that exist, this pillar, it is a veil of power. It is a pillar. It is real. It is made of concrete. It's got iron in it. No question about that. But it exists by virtue of the will and the power of God. And in that it is a hijab, al-qudr. It is a veil of power. You know, because although its, its outward reality is what you and I see, its inward reality is the same as the inward reality of all the atoms that make it up. They are veils of power. They show us the qahar of God, the quwa of God, the qudra of God. And that's why they are signs, they are ayat. Okay, so <clears throat> then the other proof that we talked about yesterday, uh, which is the most common proof that our theologians use, you know, is a rational proof. Okay, so expanding universe, empirical. Thermodynamics, empirical. Senses. Um, talking about the atom, that's also largely empirical. Although it's got a lot of theory in it, because we never saw an atom. Okay, but the re reason works in a different way. And as I told you, when I began this study years ago, I didn't understand these things at all. It was not easy for me to understand it. It required me to rethink and to retrain. And I had to ask scholars also, like, explain this to me, please. Okay, but one of the main things that they talk about 
is the fact that the world that we see around us is a world of physical bodies. Okay, like this pen. This is a physical body. This is a physical body. The sun, the moon, the stars, the soil, the plants, they're all physical bodies. They're made up of parts. They're constructed. Okay, now this body, you know, we call it a pen, right? And none of us has any question about that, that this is a pen. But what do you see when you see this pen? You actually see the pen itself? You actually see the essence of the pen itself? You know, you see colors. You see that it's silver. Uh, you can see that it comes apart. You can see that it has other parts. I could take this out too. Okay? Uh, you can see that, you know, it's got a certain color ink, black ink. Okay? But all that you can actually perceive about this pen are attributes of the pen. Right? You can see its color. You can see its shape. Uh, you know, you can see its weight. We could weigh it. Uh, we can see that it's smooth. It's not rough. Uh, we can see that it's also designed so that I can hold it in my hand and write. Uh, you know, we can make a thousand descriptions about the pen, right? But all of them are talking about attributes of the pen. The pen itself, I can only see by seeing the attributes. And this is why in our theology, we talk about the essence of things. And here we use the word joha the substance, that the substance, the word substance in English, we use it for different meanings. We could say the substance of this is metal, but they don't mean that. Here they mean substanding. Sub in Latin means what? Below, like we have subway. The subway goes below the city. Okay, so substance is that reality that stands, it has stance that is below this pin. And we call that in our theology, it's joha, it's substance. You can say essence as well, but you can never see the substance. Never, not possible. All you can see are what we call a'rad. A'rad, a'rad. And the a'rad we can call in English secondary attributes. They are attributes that are in addition to the essence. Okay? So, it's silver. I mean, we could take black paint and paint it black, and it would be black. It's still a pin. Right? Um, we also see that it has a certain weight, and we could change the weight. We see that it has a certain form, and we could change that. It's very smooth, but we could roughen it up. Right? It's still a pin. Okay? So, every body that we see in creation the sun, the moon, the stars, the animals, the fishes, the plants, everything. All that you can see are their a'rab. All that you can see are their secondary attributes. You can never see the fishness of the fish. You can never see the penness of the pen. But we say that, right? We say this is a pen. Now, some of our theologians don't like to talk about that too much. That's al-maturidi. Al-Maturidi doesn't talk very much about substance. And he does that because of the fact that the thing that everybody agrees on is attribute. So Al-Maturidi always talks about the Arab. And one of the reasons why he may do that is that Imam Al-Maturidi, he came from what city? Do you remember? Where did he come from? You know where he came from, don't you? Samarkand. He came from Central Asia, where Imam al-Bukhari came from as well, and the Zamakhshari, and Muslim. Well, Muslims are a little bit further to the west, Nisapur, right? Okay, but what was the dominant religion that was in Samarkand, and Bukhara, and Afghanistan before Islam? Ferida? Zoroastrianism was a big religion there, but the biggest religion there was another religion, which was what? Buddhism. Buddhism. This is very interesting, you know. هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ That it is he, God, and no other, who sent his messenger. So he doesn't need anything else. 
you know, in order to render it uppermost, victorious, over all other religion. He sent him with, with the guidance, with bin Huda, with Deen al Haq, with guidance in the religion of truth to make it uppermost over all religion. And this is one of the miracles of Islamic history. We have to study our history really well. In the history of religions, rarely, if ever, do you see one quote unquote major religion expand at the cost of another? Christianity spreads widely, but who are the people that Christianity spreads among? Idolaters and a few Jews, especially in the early period, because Christianity is originally a message to the children of Israel. So many Jews come into Christianity in the first and the second century. Okay, but then after that, especially when you have the development of Greek Christianity, of Hellenistic Christianity, you know, then it spreads among pagans, idolaters, the Greeks, the Romans, the Germanic tribes, and so forth. Doesn't expand, it, it rarely ever expands at the expense of Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism holds its ground. Magianism holds its ground. And the Magians and the Zoroastrians, they also spread among pagans and idolaters. Um, <clears throat> Judaism was mostly in the children of Israel, although it also spread among other people, because it has a missionary history as well. Okay? But usually Judaism will never spread by converting Christians. And Christians will never spread by converting Jews. It's very rare. It does happen, but it's not common. The same thing with Zoroastrianism. The same thing with Buddhism and with Hinduism. And Islam is the religion that when it comes, it immediately brings into its fold Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Zoroastrians, Magians, Hindus, Confucianists, Taoists, everything. And no religion in history ever did that. You know, this is something really important. And we do it, there's great studies that have been, that have been done of the spread of Islam. Usually the spread of Islam took about 200 to 300 years. You know, for Islam to become a majority religion, usually took about 200 to 300 years. Some areas are very quick, like the Zoroastrians. They come into Islam probably faster than anybody. And others are slower. But the Christian world, almost all of it comes into Islam. Because the Christian world, the heart of the Christian world was where? Trinitarian theology. The theology of the Trinity. Where did that come from? Who knows? Do you know? Alexandria. Alexandria. Trinitarian theology is Alexandrian theology. You know, there's no way you could ever understand the development of the Trinity in Christianity, which goes through five stages of development over 350 years, if you don't know about Alexandria and what was happening in Alexandria. And, uh, you know, amazing, that's an amazing story, okay? Uh, Alexandria, and then you have Antioch, Ant Antakia, which is the rival of Alexandria. Okay, and um, but the Christian world was Egypt and Syria and um, what is today Turkey, Anatolia, and then North Africa. The Latin church, the church that used the Latin language, which is the language of the Roman Catholic Church, where did they write their books? Where are all the Latin fathers of the church? Where were they from? Do you know? Hmm? Excuse me? Uh, they're from North Africa. Some are from Libya, but those are usually Greek speakers. And the others are from Tunisia and Algeria. St. Augustine who is called the father of the West, the father of Western civilization, 
and Western Trinitarian Christianity. He was a Tunisian. And others as well, because they spoke Latin there, and they cultivated Latin. So when Islam comes, you know, these lands like Egypt, Syria, Anatolia, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Spain, Portugal, these were the heartlands of Christianity. And Christianity was really important here. These are people who would rather die than give up Christianity. And they were fed to the lions. The Romans persecuted them for 300 years. And you can find like great Libyan Christians who when they're, they're told that they will be fed to the lions, they say, Ashukrulillah. They say, thanks be to God. Today I meet my Lord. Feed me to the lions. It's amazing. These were strong people. And when Islam came, Islam didn't convert anyone by force. History bears witness to that. It takes time. But as Islam became known, and as the beautiful men and women of Islam who embodied the teaching of the Prophet وسلم, who smiled, right? As the Prophet smiled, it is a sunnah to smile. We have Muslims today that they can't hardly show their teeth, you know. You know, uh, this is not the sunnah of our Prophet. Our Prophet was a beautiful person, a loving person. And when they see these people who smile and who are happy and who understand and who have this beautiful religion, then they come into the deen, afwajan. And that takes about 200, 300 years. In many cases, when the Crusaders came to Syria, to Palestine, Christians were still the majority. In Lebanon and in what is today, in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and in much of Syria, Christians were still the majority when the Crusaders came. You know, so the spread of Islam is amazing, but when Islam is that religion that convinces the Buddhist, the Confucianist, the Taoist, the Hindu, the Christian, the Jew, everybody, this is the legacy of our religion. But our religion does this when it is that jewel which we got from the Prophet ﷺ. This beautiful pearl, you know, that, this eternal message of light. And we hope and pray that in our time, Islam has been through 200 years of the most difficult history that any religious community ever went through. During those last 200 years, everything was done thinkable to destroy this religion. And yet it comes into the modern age with all of its spiritual apparatus intact. We still pray the way the Prophet prayed. We still fast the way he fasted. We still make pilgrimage the way that Abraham made pilgrimage. We still pay the zakat. We still know the law, whether we follow it or not. We still have the seerah. We still have the Qur'an. We still know how to recite it. Amazing. So this religion is alive. It is a living religion. And perhaps in our time, you know, we may even see that it begins to come back to life. But it can only come back to life if we tap into the traditions that are the living waters of the faith. You know, that go back, this deen is isnat, that go back to the way that the Prophet taught Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we were talking about Maturidi, and so why does Maturidi not talk about substance? And one reason why that may be is because he came from an area where Buddhism had been very dominant. And Buddhists don't believe in that. The Buddhists believe that they're just attributes. So Al Maturidi will talk about attributes. Attributes are what we see. Um, but Okay, so we have substance. We have this reality of the pin that underlies the pin. And then that substance receives attributes. You know, color, weight, materials, composition, order, and so forth. Okay? Now, when I talk about the pen, I see that there is a necessary relation 
between the substance of the pin, the reality of the pin, and between secondary attributes. It's not possible for me to conceive of this pin as existing as a body that's in time and space if it doesn't have matter, if it doesn't have color, if it doesn't have form, if it doesn't have weight, if it doesn't have certain attributes, right? They are essential to its nature. And when I look at these attributes, I see that all the secondary attributes of this pin, they are changing and changeable. You know, like now it's moving. A minute ago it was not. Now it's in my left hand. Now it was in my right. Now it's back in the left. You know, it moves. It's still. I can take it apart. I could even destroy it if I wanted. I could melt it down. Okay, everything, every single quality that this pin has changes and it is capable of change. Okay, so therefore, when I look at the change, what is a change? It is beginning, end. Beginning, end. You know that uh, it has now, it begins by having this beautiful color. What will it look like in 20 years? Maybe it's all rusty. Maybe I'll drop it in the ocean by mistake and it rusts. Okay, so if you find it, it's going to be an old rusty pin. Okay, that's possible. Okay, it changes. It all changes in it. All attributes in it. They have beginnings and they have ends. Okay, so then what about the pin? Can the pin in its essence be any different from that? And reason says, no, it cannot be. What is true of its necessary attributes must be true of it. Its attributes are temporal. They exist after not existing. They begin, they have beginnings. Therefore, the pin itself must have a beginning. When was the pin made? Ten days ago? It's a new gift. It was given to me ten days ago. Could be. Could have been made a year ago or two years ago. Could have been made ten years ago. That I don't know. That I cannot know through reason. My reason is not able to say that April 11th, 1948. It's not able to do that. Okay? In order to make a statement about when exactly the pin was made, we enter into probability. And we're going to base that on experience and markets and things like that. Okay? But that's not important. What I know is that it has a beginning. It has a beginning. And therefore it is temporal. It exists in space and time. And this is true of the world around us. And this is why Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran tells us over and over again about change. اِخْتِلَافُ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ The alteration of the day and the night. Right? The rise of the sun, the setting of the sun. You know, رَبُّ الْمَشَارِقِ وَالْمَغَارِبِ The Lord of the East, the Lord of the West, because the sun sometimes comes up here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then it goes back to here. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِالْخُنَّسِ الْجَوَارِ الْكُنَّسِ You know, the, the, star, the planets in the sky, you know, they hide and then they come back. You see them in the west and then you see them back in the east. Okay, so this is change. And this change indicates to us that the heavens and the earth and everything in it is temporal. It exists in space and time. And because it exists in space and time, it has a beginning. Everything in space and time must have a beginning. Okay, everything in space and time must have a beginning. And therefore we call in Arabic what? Hadith. Hadith, mawjudun ba'd al-adam. Al-huduthu huwa al-wujudu ba'd al-adam. That temporality, huduth, is existence after non-existence. This pin is hadith because it exists after non-existing. There was a time when it did not exist. And you cannot tell me that, no, no, this is a pharaonic pin. This pin was here in the days of Pharaoh, of Pharaoh Ramses or something the second. 
And actually he got it from some soothsayer who brought it from the foundation of the earth. It's not like any other pin. You know, no, that can't be. This pin, even if it goes back to the days of Ramses, it's got to have a beginning. It had to have a maker. And I know that through the eye of intellect. This is why it's so important for us to learn to use those eyes. You know, we have to train ourselves. And I believe that in the teaching of theology, one of the things that we should do as we write books on theology is to actually have exercises in intellect. You know, because we have to practice it now. We don't do it anymore. But, um, you know, we have to, you know, if you, if you don't lose, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? If you don't use your muscles, you lose your muscles. If you don't use your brain, you lose your brain. And the same thing with intellect. If we don't use it, and we are trained not to use it in the West, no metaphysical intrusions, you know, then, yes, Absolutely, ask. Uh, I understand the change part, but hmm. I guess what I do not understand is uh, maybe it's a sum of my knowledge when you said to find the fishness of the fish. You see the fish, you don't see the fish. Mm -hmm. uh, your plan example is great, I can see it, but because it changes and I see the change, the mm -hmm. plan, that's why I know there's a beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how would I relate this to the fact? Oh, the, the sun, the, we all know that the sun goes through amazing changes, right? That it's in a stage of its history. Its history is very long, okay? But the sun burns and it has explosions every day. And you have gases that are shooting up millions of kilometers into the air. That's change. Everything about the sun is change. Its uh, nuclear reactions that it has are changes. And the sun itself, we believe based on the study of other stars, you know, it went through stages, right? Where it's hotter and colder. And then we believe that as the sun gets older and older, it begins to collapse on itself. It becomes heavier. And then it will take Mercury and Venus into it. And then the earth will become barren, just white sand, no mountains, nothing, just like the day of judgment. Okay, so the sun changes, and you don't see the fishness of the fish. All you see of the fish are his colors, his scales, his fins, his gills. You see attributes of the fish. But what is it that makes the fish a fish? And is it just the conjunction of those attributes? You see the difference? So the fish is no different from the pin, and the pin is no different from the sun. All of these are changing. And also we would say that they are potentially changing. So, for example, we might see um, a big granite mountain, you know, like some of the ones you have in Africa. We have some in America as well. These big granite outcroppings, which is one big granite mountain, solid rock, okay, and it seems like it doesn't change, you know, it's just this one shape, it's been this way for maybe 500 years or since people saw it, but it also has changes, you know, cracks get in it when it rains, uh, it turns into dust, it turns into uh, sand, you know, and its changes are not as clear, but they're also there as well, okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. so, that's a review, and that took us almost all the class, right? <laughs> so, uh, is there any hope for us? Inshallah. Let's look at the verses again. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qala Muhammadun hu wabnu Jafara laqabu katanin alayhi qadajara. Muhammad said, the son of Jafar, widely known by a name from selling linen, telling you who he is that he is the authority from whom you are taking this knowledge, and he is authorized. And we know that this is his poem because 
I happen to have received it by transmission from honest people. Hamdan liman awjadana min al adam wa khassana bi khayri man lahu al qadam. Out of praise for God, he says this, who gave us existence from non existence. This is what we talked about just now and what we talked about yesterday as well. And gave us special distinction through our Prophet, the best of those having preeminence. The best of, in God's creation, He creates from nothing. He also creates beautiful and more beautiful and less beautiful, magnificent and less magnificent. And the greatest thing that He created of all is what? The messengers and the Prophets. Ar Rusul wal Anbiya. These are Khayrul Khalq in our belief. And that's a big, big belief. Great things come out of that. You know, the greatest of them all is the last of them all. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you have the messengers, you have the prophets, you have then the special angels like Gabriel and Michael and Israfil and Azrael and so forth. And then you have, after that, you have the Abu Bakr and you have Umar and Uthman and Ali and the ten who were promised paradise among whom are those four and then we rank the believers in that order that's also part of our belief okay so that you know there are there is a hierarchy in creation God creates the most beautiful thing the first thing, and then out of that, he creates many other things as well. Okay, and this is an aqidah, which we just leave at that. We say that the greatest of all created things is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And the greatest of all created things after him are the messengers and the prophets. And then we can say the great angels, the archangels. And then we can say Abu Bakr. Umar, Uthman, Ali, this is the position of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we don't have disagreements about that. And then the rest of the Ashura and the Bashirin, then the people of Badr, the people of Uhud, and so forth. This is our belief. But the important thing here is that the Prophets are the greatest of all the things that God created from nothing. And how He created them, the miracle of the creation of them, these are things that pertain to Aqidah, but they also go into Haqiqah. They go into the ultimate reality of the world. Then he says after that, Salla alayhi rabbuna wa sallama wa alihi wa kulli man lahun tama. So he says, May our Lord extol him and grant him special grace and those who follow him in belief and are affiliated to him. Um, the Salat on the Prophet, uh, I don't think there's any need to elaborate on that, but the Salat of Allah on His Prophet and of the angels is one of the most amazing things in the universe. And it is the Yadatu Tashrifin wa Takrimin wa I'adham. That the most noble of all things God created is the messengers and the prophets. And God created them in nobility. He gave them sharaf. And He gave them karam. And He gave them adhama. And in His salat on them, He increases them in that at every instant of time and space. So that the prophets, the messengers, are always growing and growing and growing in their perfection. God manifests His perfection in them, in the first creation of them, and then He increases that. And when we do salat on the Prophet ﷺ, then God reciprocates. So He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا This is a command. And He says, God does it. The angels do it. You must also do it. And when we do that, and this is what he's doing, he's obeying the command, then God gives you rahmah. And he gives you salama. And he gives you aman. Okay? And uh, so the salat for the Prophet 
is that Allah gives him ziyad tashrif wa takreem wa i'zam. He gives him increased nobility and generosity and greatness. And all the prophets and messengers. Okay, but that salat for us reciprocates by mercy. So when we do salat on the Prophet, and we should always do that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then God gives mercy to you. He blesses you, blesses your face, blesses your eyes, blesses your heart. He gives you salama. He saves you from the disastrous situation and brings you into a better situation. And He gives you a man, security for the future. And it's also tahiyya, tayyiba. It is also a great greeting that you gave salams to the Prophet, Allah then gives salams to you. What is that? Allah gives me greetings? I give greetings to Him? You know, so this is a great thing. Because Allah's greeting me is not like He's turning away from me. To greet me and to greet you, He turns to you. You know, He has mercy on you. He accepts you. So it's part of rida. It's part, it's the key. It's a very, very important thing. Okay, and then he says, Salla alayhi rabbuna wa sallama wa alihi. And the word al, uh, we, uh, it, like the word salat, salat has different meanings, right? As salatu min Allahi ziyadat tashrifi wa ta'zimi wa takreem. Okay, and as salatu ala ghayrihi is. Ziyadatul Rahmah, wa salama, wa aman, wa tahiyyatun tayyiba, right? So these words have different meanings. It's very interesting. As we'll see when we talk about aqidah, it's one of the most important things. What do words mean? When we say kalam, that God has speech, what does that mean when we talk about God? What it means for you, we know. You make sounds and you put your words in order. But when we talk about Allah, it's another thing. So kalam, when we refer to Allah, it means one thing. Kalam, when it refers to you and me, it refers to another. Basar. I see by virtue of these miraculous gifts that God has put in our heads, these eyes, may Allah protect our eyes, protect our faces, right? But that's so that I can understand what seeing is. But what God sees as al-basir, that's something totally different. That's, and this enables me to relate to that. Doesn't it, it, it's not the same. So words have different meanings. And also the word al is one of those words that has different meanings. And so if we talk about the law and we talk about zakat, we will limit the al to ahlul bayt, to the descendants of the Prophet who are not allowed to receive zakat. The ones who we do not, uh, you know, who we, they, they receive a part of the public treasury. We don't give them sadaqah. We don't give them zakat. And they are honorable people. We have to honor them. Okay? Uh, and then when we talk about madh, we talk about praise, like praising Al Muhammad, then it refers to kudu taqi. It refers to every man and woman who follows the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and who obeys him. And when we talk about dua, which is here, it's all the believers. All the believers who follow him. Why? Because ziyadat al-rahmah. We want to expand the word, not because we don't love Ahlul Bayt, because we love Ahlul Bayt. This is our deen, is the love of the Sahaba and Ahlul Bayt. But because when we make this dua, we want to include everybody that we can. So when we say al in the dua, we mean every one of us ta'ala. We don't want to be excluded from that. And then we say وَكُلِّ مَنْ لَهُنْ tama and those who are affiliated with him, which could be by kinship or by following him and so forth. Okay, then we'll take verse 4. We'll try to make some progress, inshaAllah. يَا أَيُّهَا الْعَبْدُ الضَّعِيفُ الْمُذْنِبُ المرتجي تصحيح عقد يجب أول ما على العباد قد وجب معرفة الباري ورسل انتخب So he says يا أيها العبد الضعيف المذنب Servant of God weak and wrongful hoping to set right a belief that is binding 
Al-Murtaji Tashiha Aqdin. Aqd here means Aqidah. It is a basic creed. So it's here Aqidah. And for the Wazan, he says Aqd. Al-Murtaji Tashiha Aqdin Yajibu. So um, then he says after that, Awalu ma ala al-ibadi qad wajab ma'rifatu al-bari wa ruslun intakhab. So the first of what is obligatory for God's servants is knowledge of the Creator and messengers God has chosen. Okay, so um, let's talk about these verses and I don't think we need to go into a great deal of detail here. So if you'll permit me, we'll try to go through this quickly um, because we want to get to the next aqidah. But this is very important that the first obligation of Islam, according to many of our scholars, and maybe it's a consensus, I'm not able to say if it is a consensus, but it is a dominant opinion, that the first obligation of Islam is to learn this, and that it comes before the obligation to learn wudu, to learn how to make salat, to learn how to fast. This does not mean that we shouldn't be making wudu and we shouldn't be praying and we shouldn't be fasting until we get this done. It doesn't mean that. The Prophet said, uh, you know, uh, command your children to pray when they're seven years old. You know, they're, they're not even obliged to pray yet. And they maybe don't even understand what they're doing, but we train them to pray. Because then when the time to pray, or co pray comes, you know, when they reach maturity and they have intellect, they're able to do it easily. Okay, so it's not as if everything else shouldn't be done until we have accomplished this. But this, in terms of priority, is the first belief, the first obligation. The first obligation, the obligation to have sufficient knowledge of your Lord. And your knowledge of Allah will never end. Your knowledge of Allah is infinite. And this is the greatest thing in the world. Um, you know, it's the ahla ma fi wujud. Ahla shay fi wujud ma'rifatu rabbina. There is no thing more beautiful and sweet in creation than to know your Lord. This is what gives your heart peace. This is what you were created for. This is what gives you ecstasy. You know, we are people who are created to enjoy. We are created to be filled with joy. We are created to be overwhelmed by ecstasy. We are created to be happy. But the crux of that is the belief in God, the knowledge of God. And that knowledge, when it's created, when it is proper, there is nothing more beautiful. There's nothing thinkable that is more beautiful. And you know, or you will find, that it's all you need. If I have, man wajad Allah lam yafqud shay'an, whoever discovers God has not missed anything. You know, we go through this life. Man wajad Allah falam yafqud shay'an. Whoever discovers God in this world and believes in Him and loves Him and serves Him, he has not missed anything. Even though he might be an invalid, even though he may be a pauper, even though he may be a rich man or a rich woman. Woman faqad Allah lam yajid shay'an. And whoever misses Finding God has not found anything. That's the truth. And this is why we see people, they run here and there. I want more land, I want more houses, I want more cars, I've got to do this investment. I can double my money this way. And then women, men, games, gambling, all these things. These are illusions. But they are illusions that attract us because of the fact that we have this need to be happy. We have this need to be filled. We have this need to be in ecstasy. And so I think maybe I could find it in heroin. Ah, for one minute you'll find it. And then it's dark after that. Or maybe I find it in this. No, nothing in the haram will ever give you that. The halal, that's different. The halal gives beauty upon beauty upon beauty. 
Haram never does that. It attracts us that way. But then we find ourselves empty. We have a brother named Baraka Blue, who some of you know, he's a great poet. Great poet. And he was with us in the Gambia for about a month. And he told me, he comes from Seattle, and he told me of a very wealthy man in Seattle who is one of the big dealers in the United States. He's a person who, you know, if you have um, uh, a conference, you know, to get money, to raise money, uh, he will always be one of the people there because he's the one who can write the big check. He's got lots of money. And he loves Baraka Blue. He's known him for many years. He knows his family. But he told Ahmed James, who's Baraka Blue, he told him, he said, my life is empty. He said, I'll tell you that. He said, I know this is all empty. And all these things these billionaires have, like me, it's all empty. He said, I know that. And I'll tell you that. Maybe Allah will guide him. Because that's the reality. Because, you know, I cannot find that happiness that I need in anything but my Lord. There I can find it, in the love of God, in the love of the Messenger, and living a good life. And then our lives become beautiful, even if we are poor people. And may we not be that, may we be wealthy people. You know, may Allah bless this country. Egypt was the granary of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire lived off of Egypt. Egypt produced, it is so wealthy, the grain that was produced, it fed the whole Roman Empire fed the Roman armies. You know, this is a wealthy land with an ancient history. And may Allah bless its people and may He enable this land to stand on its feet and to be the great land that it is. Okay? With our deen. We don't want to be poor. We don't want to be paupers. You know, but the bottom line is that if we find Allah, we have found everything. And if we don't find Allah, we have found nothing. You can have, all, you know, we had in the United States this man named Howard Hughes. You know about him? Howard Hughes. In the 1920s, he was the big dealer, you know, roaring 20s, and he had millions. They didn't have billions in those days. They had to print it, you know. We don't print money now, so we can have billions and trillions. When you have to print money, I'm sorry, you can't do that, you know. Um, but. He had big money, and then the Depression came in 1929. The Depression, people lost everything. Many people committed suicide. And Hughes, he still was flying high. He owned Pan Am Airlines. You know, he had all the women, all the money, everything he needed. And people would look at Howard Hughes as like this idol. And then towards the end of his life, all of it became dark. And he was filled with fears and paranoias. And he wouldn't have a house. He only lived in hotels. And he'd always have thick curtains and they're always closed. He's afraid of the light. He doesn't want to cut his fingernails. His fingernails grew long. You know, he became insane, basically. And there was no happiness for him in anything. Not in the food he ate, not in the drinks that he drank, nothing. You know, this is the reality of this world. You know, it cannot give you what you need. And the first obligation is to know your Lord. So what we're doing here is the fulfillment of an obligation. And because it is, and you have probably fulfilled it before. I know many of you have studied this well. You don't need to come here to learn it. But always these obligations, it's good to repeat them. You know, we talk about in Islam, At-Tariqatul Rabbaniya fil ilm The lordly path of knowledge. The way of the Rabbaniyin and the Rabbaniyat. The Rabbani, the man of the Lord. The person who loves the Lord. The woman who loves the Lord. They always love Sirar al-ilmi qabla kibarihi. They love the little knowledge before the big. And they always like to go back to the little. Because it never gets old. This is also one of the qualities of the believer, that every day for you should be the first day, you know, and uh, living with our children, living, living with our wives, living with our families, you know, every day should be like the first day. If it's not, there's something wrong. Because the Rabbani is not that way. The Rabbani, every day is the first day. The beauty that you see in your spouse is the beauty you saw the first day. 
If that's not the case, it means that something is wrong here. Something is wrong in the relation. This is the way we are. The way the world around us appears to us, us should be as amazing today as it was when we were little, when we were children, and the whole world was amazing, right? This is the Rabbani. The world does not grow old for us. The world stays alive for us. Okay, and therefore the knowledge, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. When I studied Tajweed, with, which was with Sheikh Ayman Suwaid, he made me recite Fatiha for three years. And he was never happy. He never said, now you have it. In fact, he said, you don't have it yet. You know, and I would recite over again and do my best. Even when the people took me, they said, this man has a good recitation of Warsh. And he says, I'm going to teach you Hafs. And then, you know, he was never happy with me a single day. A single day. But Al-Fatiha never gets old. Right? It's beautiful. And it should never grow old for us. Because this is the gift also of being spiritually alive. This is the gift of being connected. Okay, so may we also feel that this knowledge is big. The little knowledge is the big knowledge. It is the basis of the deen. And here he refers to us as, Ya ayyuhal abdu da'if al muznibu. That's not very polite, is it? And I hope none of you are offended. Ya ayyuhal abdu da'if al muznibu. He didn't say ama. He's just talking about us. Right? He didn't say, Ya ayyatuhal amatu da'ifatul muzniba. La, la. He says, Ya ayyuhal abd. Okay, he's talking about the men, right? He's not talking about the women. But um, this is the way that he is talking to us as a teacher. Because of the fact that if I don't know this about myself, then there's nowhere I can go. That if I don't know that I am da'if, I am maghroor. And this is my nature. Right? That I am weak. These are what we call sifatul bashariya. These are the attributes of humanness. Al-da'f, al-ajz, al-iftiqar, al-faqar we call it, al-iftiqar. Al-dhul, insignificance. You know, Allah is the one who makes you significance. I am dhalil. Who am I? I can't continue to breathe another breath. I can't make my heart beat another beat. And I cannot speak to you if Allah doesn't give me the ability to do that. Right? I don't have any inherent essential ability to do anything. It's a gift. Everything Allah gives me and gives you is a gift. Right? I have eyes to see, but they're a gift. I have ears to hear, but they're a gift. And who am I? I created none of that. And it's not like you are the one who won the lottery you know, other people were dumb, but you're smart. No, that's not the way it works. It's not by random. These were gifts that were given to you. These were amanas that were given to you. How will you deal with them? You will be judged according to that. Okay, so I am abdun da'ifun muznib. I have to know this about myself. I am makhluqun min al-adam. I'm created from nothing. So what claim do I have? What claim do I have? And this is why the believer is humble. The believer is humble. And when we see believers that are not humble, there's something wrong. Because there's no place for arrogance. There's no place for condescension. Okay, that's not the way we are. And al-iman goes hand in hand with husnul khuluq. These are like tawaman. They're like two identical twins. Al-iman wa husnul khuluq. And this is because they have the same genealogy. Uh, what is the basis of husnul khuluq? You know, you're generous, you're kind, you're honest, you're thoughtful, you're brave. You know, maybe you don't know you're brave, but you probably are. You know, I know of an Eritrean woman who lived in a village. She was a beautiful woman. And they lived in straw huts. They were nice huts, but they're made of straw. And one of the huts caught fire. And in the hut were four babies. And the hut is burning around the babies. And what did she do? She ran into the hut 
and she caught on fire. All of her hair was burned. All of her clothes were burned. And she got the four babies, and she wrapped the four babies, and she took them out. And she was ugly for the rest of her life. You know, her face was burned, her, but she did not stop. She did everything to get the babies in the blankets and to wrap them up and to get them out. She didn't care about her eyes, her, about her ears, about, and she wasn't even married. It's a young woman, beautiful woman. But she was brave. And when it came my life or the baby's life, no question. No question. No question. I will go into this inferno and I will save those babies. And I don't care about me. That is husnul khuluq at the highest level. Okay, and most of you, all of you, are people like that, I'm sure. It's just that, alhamdulillah, Allah doesn't test you. May He not test us. You know, but this is husnul khuluq. You know, generosity, courage, honesty, trustfulness, amana, um, iffa, haya, and so forth. Beautiful thing. But what do they all have in common? They all have in common tawadu. Tawadu. That I put myself, you put yourself low because you're a humble man. I want to be lower. Then you say, no, I'll be lower. I'll be lower than you. I have no claim. Yes. Uh, no, that question is not allowed. Questions about vocabulary. Okay. Yeah, because other questions you can write it up and inshallah we will answer it in a few minutes, okay? But vocabulary, that you can ask about, okay? So, tawaf is humility, yes. Sorry? Okay, so tawadu'a is humility. And literally tawadu'a means I put myself lower than you. See? Adu'a nafsi dunik. That's literally what it means. So tawadu'a is when I do not see myself as better. I do not see myself as having a right over you. I see you as having a right. I see you as better. Okay, and this is the way the believers are. They are mutawadi'un. They are humble people. Okay, and then there's a second quality that is there, which is al-ithar. Al-ithar. Ithar is preferring others over yourself. Preferring others over yourself. وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا they prefer others over themselves even if they have a dire need. Okay, so when you have those two qualities and ithar comes from tawadu, see, then you have husn al Good morality always has those elements, whether it's courage, whether it's honesty, whether it's trustfulness, whatever, it always is tawadu. And then ithar. What is belief? Well, we're going to study about belief. That belief is Allahu Akbar. It's not Ana Akbar. And if we have kibr in our hearts, then Allahu Akbar is a kathib. Right? If I have pride in my heart, then when I say Allahu Akbar, I'm just making sounds. But when in my heart there is no kibr, there is no arrogance, there is no pride, then Allahu Akbar is Siddiq. Huwa al Akbar. Huwa al Azim. Huwa al Aziz. Huwa al Rafi'i. Right? So belief has in it tawadu. And Abdullah. And Azzu Asma'i Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al Abd. The most noble and honorable of all the names of the Prophet is not Al Mukhtar, Al Muslim. It's Abdullah. Abdullah wa Rasuluhu. Okay, and then you have also Ithar, which is I recognize the right of the other. I put the other above myself. And that's what belief is. That Allah has the greatest rights of all. And so therefore I will obey Him. I will try not to disobey Him. I will worship Him. I will serve Him. You see, so these two things, Iman, 
and husn uh, al they're like twins. And the reverse is also true. That disbelief, kufr, and su al khuluq they are also like twins. Bad character, lying, cheating, uh, breaking our trusts, cowardice, uh, avarice, all of these qualities, they are based usually on the opposite of tawakwa, that I am special, I am important, I am the most important, I am the significant person. Okay, and then also not preferring the other over the self. So it's all about me, and it's all about how I can use you. Like, ah, this person knows so-and-so, so I should make him my friend, and then maybe I could get that job. Right? This is su al khuluq ad-deen al-nasiha. The religion is sincerity in everything we say and do. So nasiha is that I have to want for you what is good for you, not what's good for me. Okay, but how many of us can do that? That takes husn al khuluq It takes real tawadu, and then it takes real ithar. That what I care about you is you and your welfare, not me and my welfare. And kufr, what is kufr? The essence of kufr is kufran. So it is failure to recognize the right of God. It's not necessarily that you don't believe in God, but you don't recognize His right. You don't recognize the right over you that He has. So those two things go together. The person of su'ul khuluq, they don't recognize the right of any person. People are just to be manipulated, they're just to be used. You know, they're just, uh, you know, I can lie, I can cheat. It's just a question of like, will that come back to haunt me? You know, will I get away with it? That's the only consideration. That's Allah al afu al-afiyah. You know, and, um, you know, so these two go together. And, um, you know, it's very important for us, therefore, to have the tawadu that comes from understanding the truthfulness of this verse. Ya ayyuhal abdul da'if al mudhnibu. Okay, when have I ever fulfilled the right of God? When for a single moment have I ever given thanks for eyes that can see or ears that can hear or a mind that can learn? And when have you ever done that? You know, if Allah were to take me to task and to hold me uh, to the fulfillment of the right He has over me, I am halik. I have no hope whatsoever. So I am muqassir fi kulli shayt. And they say that you cannot know your Lord until you know yourself. You know, you cannot know your Lord until you know yourself. And the most important thing that you know about yourself is that you are da'if and ajiz and muftaqir. I am dependent upon Allah for everything. I could forget everything that I have ever learned just like that, right? What if one of us had a stroke, for example? I have a friend in Chicago who had a stroke just a month ago. It's almost like everything is lost. Doesn't remember anything. Okay, that could happen to you. That could happen to me, right? Who am I? So I have to know who I am. And then I know my Lord by contrast. Because... And if you have izza and you do, al lil mu'mineen. Okay, but you have it by virtue of him. And ana da'if, who will qawi? Okay, ana al ajiz, who al qadr? And ana al faqir, al muftaqir, who al ghani? Al qayyum. Right? So, and the more that we know that, the more we come to know Allah. Because then you have what we call mushahada, that you're witnessing the miracle of God working in your life. That He's the one who gave you the beautiful words to say. He's the one who gave you the beautiful ideas. He's the one who gave you the beautiful perceptions. He's the one who made things possible. And we give thanks to Him for that. Okay, so He says then, أيها العبد الضعيف المذنب المرتج تصحيح عقد يجب أول ما على العباد قد وجب معرفة الباري ورسل انتخب. And this includes also the knowledge of the samiyat, 
of the things heard. Because we believe in God, we believe in his book, we believe in his messengers. We believe what they taught, so that, that's understood here. And then he says, فَوَاجِبٌ لِرَبِّنَا الْوُجُودُ قِدَمُهُمْ ثُمَّ الْبَقَى الْمَمْدُودُ So now with this he begins 13 attributes. And when you finish this class, the most important thing for you to know are the 13 attributes. Does God have 13 attributes? Why not 14? What not? Why not 15? Allah has infinite attributes. He has infinite names. He doesn't have just 99 names. He has 99 names, 100 less one, that if you know them and protect them and preserve them, you will go to the garden. Those 99 names are the Ummahatul Asma. They are the foundational names. And they are the names which reflect creation. They reflect God as creator in creation. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, Al-Salam, Al-Mu'min, Al-Muhaymin, Al-Aziz, Al-Jabbar, Al-Mutakabbar, and so forth. They are Ummahat Al-Asma. But they are not all the Asma. God has infinite Asma. And he has names under the names. Okay? And he has names that only he knows. Okay? And then God has also attributes that are infinite. But the 13 attributes are the attributes which our scholarly tradition, by its ijtihad, has determined that if you know these, you know what is sufficient. And if you know these, you have the asas. You have the foundation upon which to build ma'rifatullahi ta'ala. Okay, so it's like if we say, for example, فَرَائِدُ الْوُضُوءُ سَبْعٌ We say there are seven, right? And the Hanafis might say there are four, and we have difference of opinion about that. But we believe that there are seven things that you've got to have. Okay, and then there are eight which are sunan, and there's ten which are fada'il. Okay, this is ijtihad, and this is fiqh. But here, the ulama of Ilm al Tawheed have said that you must understand these 13 attributes. And all the other attributes, they will come under that. But if you don't know any of these 13, then there is a very serious deficiency in your understanding of God. So these, therefore, are like the foundational attributes of God. They're like the seven fara'id of wudu that are the basics of wudu. Okay? And um, so we begin here with number one, and um, it's actually um, the most important of them all. So, فَوَاجِبٌ لِرَبِّنَا الْوُجُودُ What does that mean? It means the first attribute of God is al-wujud al-wajib. The fawajibun li rabbina al-wujud mean that the first attribute of God that we must know is al-wujud al-wajib, which we call in English necessary existence. Necessary existence. And this is an attribute that is all alone. It is by itself. We call it in Arabic as-sifatun nafsiyya. We call it as-sifatun nafsiyya. As-sifatun nafsiyya is any attribute that you cannot conceive of the thing without it. Okay, that it is the most essential attribute of the thing. Sifatun nafsiyya is not just for God. For example, the pen as a body and time and place also has sifatun nafsiyya. It also has self-attributes or ontological attributes. Ontological means about the nature of being, about the neat nature of existence. So this pen has got to occupy a mahal. It has to have a locus. Mahal is a locus. Makan is the place where the locus is. So the table is the makan. It is the location or the place. 
the pin itself is the mahal, it is the locus. This pin occupies a vacuum, right? It occupies space. This is called its mahal. It's got to have a mahal. And it has to have certain other attributes that pertain to that, like being still or moving. These are also called sifatun nefsiyah. They are ontological attributes with regard to the pin. Now that this pin is a mahal, and it has a makan, it's either still on that makan, or it's moving to another makan. Okay, these are, I cannot conceive of this pen without those kind of attributes. It's also got to have six directions. Right, left, front, back, up, below. That's also sifatun nefsiya. That is called an ontological attribute, a self-attribute. So existence for God is a self-attribute, an ontological attribute. It's not for this pin. This pin doesn't have to exist. It's not necessary that this pin exist. We could destroy it right now. And it didn't exist 200 years ago. Okay? It does exist now. Okay, so have I lost anybody? Ontological. O N. T O L O. You got it? MashaAllah. And it's from it is from being. It is the study of ontos. It is the study of being. Ontos is a Greek word. So it's the the logi, the study of being. And so it's about the nature of, of, of the being. And um, so this is the first attribute of God. It is necessary being. And inshallah, we will start with that tomorrow. Is that okay? Because it's nine o'clock. And um, we would like to start tomorrow at seven o'clock. Today we started at seven, what, 20? 7.30? Um, but, you know, I don't want to take too much time because I know that it's hard for you to come here. You've got many of you, like an hour and a half to go to get home. Um, you know, we don't want to make it difficult. You know, you're very kind. I know that you're people who, if we went on to 12 o'clock, you'd probably stay. But we don't want to do that because we'd like you to come every night. And I'm honored by your presence. And I really hope and pray that Allah illuminates my heart and that He illuminates your hearts and that He makes us understand this knowledge. And you will see, inshallah, that when we understand this, this is the most important knowledge for the present time. Whether we want to talk about quantum mechanics, which is big physics, the way that atoms work, whether we want to talk about evolution and Darwin, whether we want to talk about um, DNA, or we want to talk about uh, expanding universe theory, or atoms, or thermodynamics, this is really important. And inshallah, you will see that when you understand this, you've got the key. We can even, and we are the greatest scientists. We are great scientists in our past and in our future, inshallah. But, you know, we've got to be able to understand these things. And then, like things like quantum mechanics. Do you know what quantum mechanics is? It's about the atom, right? The electron. It's amazing. But, like, for us, that's not a problem at all. That is not what everything that is in quantum mechanics, which essentially is showing that there is no determination that can be calculated from the material world. This to us is a theological gift. This is what we've been saying for over a thousand years. You know, so inshallah, may Allah enable us to understand this. Um, اللهم وفقنا لما تحبه وترضى وجعلنا من عبيدك السعداء وأمتنا على كلمة الهدى علمنا ما ينفعنا ووفقنا للعمل بما علمتنا به وجعل ما نحن فيه خالصا مخلصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم جعل تجمعنا هذا تجمع مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرق معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما آمين 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 يا رب العالمين um, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So we we'll take uh, a few minutes for questions. Bismillahir uh, Taala. This question says, "Why does change prove the existence of God? It proves the beginning and the end, but not what is before. 
uh, the beginning or the end? Is it a leap of faith? So this is a very, very good question. And um, we will talk about this, inshallah, in the days ahead. That which is, that which has a beginning and therefore is finite, it cannot account for its own existence. So when we talk about Kuduth, which is existence after non-existence, then there is a corollary. The word corollary means a lazim. It is a, an idea that necessarily comes because of that position. So when we say that the world is hadith, then we also say the world is muftaqir. Muftaqir. Muftaqir means that it is contingent. Contingent means it has need of something else that accounts for it. It has to have a cause. So huduth, which is temporality, it also requires, it also leads to iftiqar. It means that this thing which is created, which exists in time, it must have an explanation. It has to have a cause. Okay, and that cause cannot be hadith. It cannot be temporal like it. So this brings us to the discussion of necessary being, which is what we will talk about tomorrow. It's a very good question. This is a really good question. Okay, it's true. If we say that we look at change, change just shows me that this cup has a beginning. And if I look at the change in this pillar or in the sun or the moon, it just shows me that they have a beginning. But that fact that they have a beginning means that they cannot have created themselves. And they're, okay, uh, one of our great scholars says, مَنْ لَا وُجُودَ لِذَاتِهِ مِنْ ذَاتِهِ فَوُجُودُهُ لَوْ لَاهُ عَيْنٌ مُحَالِي مَا لَا وُجُودَ لِذَاتِهِ مِنْ ذَاتِهِ فَوُجُودُهُ لَوْ لَاهُ لَوْ لَا اللَّهِ تَعَالَى عَيْنٌ مُحَالِي That which has no existence of its essence from its essence, which is all possible things, all things that have beginnings, its existence, if it were not for God, who is the necessary existent one, is Ainul Muhali, is the very essence of impossibility. That's a really important um, point. And as the person who wrote this, says, uh, he or she says, is it a leap of faith? No, no, it's not a leap of faith. This is reason. This is pure reason. And this, when we talk about this also, we talk about something that we mentioned in the first class. And that is, there cannot be an infinite regress of finite causes. In other words, I can say that, okay, the watch changes, so it has a beginning, therefore it must have a maker. That was a human being. The human being had a father, he had a grandfather, he had a great-grandfather, okay? So we can go back, 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 but you've got to go back to a beginning. You cannot have an infinite regress of finite causes. All of them are muftaqira. You cannot do that. That is rationally impossible. And today, uh, using modern mathematics, we also can say, as modern mathematics does say, that if you have an infinite set, they would say you cannot have one, but if you had an infinite set, you could never cross it. So infinite regress in the past, if that were the case, you could never get to the present. You could never have a present moment. So this is a really important question, and I'm very glad that the person asked this question. And inshallah, tomorrow we will begin with this, because this is what we want to talk about tomorrow. Um, then this person is also saying, can you give salah to any other prophet than the prophet Muhammad? Or only salam, which is the prophet. This is a fiqh question. It's not an aqidah question. 
Um, when we mention prophets, we say alayhim as salam, and as a rule, um, we, we when we give salat, we give salat on the prophet first, and then on other prophets after him. And why is that the case? Um, I don't really have the knowledge that enables me to answer that. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind is Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi You see, so Allah and His angels, they do salat on the Prophet. And this means the Prophet Muhammad. You know, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taseema So I would believe that in light with that verse, we prefer to do salat on the Prophet first and then other Prophets after him. And again, uh, we don't, by that, uh, want to belittle in any way what we think about any messenger or prophet. They are all perfect human beings and great human beings. And as the prophet said, uh, you know, don't declare me to be more excellent than Jonas. You know, because you say Jonas turned from the city and he was swallowed by the fish. So don't think that I am more excellent than Jonas. We don't do that. And certainly not with regard to the great you know, people of God, Jesus and Moses and Noah and Abraham. But because of the Quranic injunction, and perhaps there are other reasons, then when it comes to Salat, we do the Salat on the Prophet first, and then the other Prophets follow him. Wallahu a'lam. Um, it's a really good question. Very, very good questions. What is the difference between ghurur and confidence? Um, sometimes confidence is ghurur. You know, people... Um, but um, delusion and confidence, uh, you know, those, those could be overlapping. But certainty... Confidence of certainty and ghurur, uh, those are different things. And, you know, we have principles of thought, we have principles of understanding, um, you know, uh, we have the grounds of reason, and these are things that enable us to say that this is true and this is false, and that certain things are illusion or delusion and other things are not. And uh, that is, is very, very important. Um, in is Islam, you know, we have a prophetic law that enables us to live in such a way that the intellect flourishes. The intellect, as we said yesterday, it has only three rules. Necessary, Impossible and possible. It doesn't have anything more to say. Anything that you ask, pure reason, it can only say, this is necessary. It must be. This is impossible. It cannot be. This is possible. It could be. It could be. Okay, that's what it does. And, um, you know, one of the greatnesses of the human being is the ability to understand the necessity of the necessary. One plus one is two, necessary. There's no universe where that's not going to be the case. You know, the sum of the triangles of a Euclidean triangle are always 180. It cannot be other than that. Okay, and all you have to know are the theorems and the axioms. The theorems and the axioms, they don't have to be proven. I mean, they don't have, you don't go to a laboratory to prove them. They're proven by rational thought. Okay, that's the necessity of the necessary. And then the impossibility of the impossible. Okay, and we'll talk about things like that. And then you have the possibility of the possible. This is really, really important. Okay, now how can I hold to that? And in my Sharia, the prophetic way of life, the prophetic law, the way that leads to water, the way that leads to life, you know, we also have wajib, Haram. We have mandub and, and makru, and we have mubah. So this is fiqh. Fiqh, I know that this is wajib, this is mandub. It's not wajib. This is 
Haram, this is makru. It's not haram. We don't confuse these things. And many Muslims today, everything's either wajib or haram. They don't know that this is makru, this is mandub, this is mubah. When we live our lives that way, existentially, then we create a, a reality in ourselves, which we would call tertib rabbani, and, and a lordly organization of the self. Tertib rabbani. So that I can also relate to al-wajib, al-mustahil, and al jaz This is really important. And when we look at people who don't live that way, um, I myself was among people like that before I became a Muslim. You know, you go to bed when you want to go to bed, you get up when you want to get up, you drink what you want to drink, you eat what you want to drink, right? You go out if you want to go out, you do whatever you want to do. You want to study all night and wake up at 10 a.m., you can do that, as long as you don't miss your class. Okay, this is the way that we lived in college, basically. I was very serious in college, but I didn't believe in college. I wasn't a believer at that time. I'd left Christianity. Okay? So you just do whatever you want to do. And in that world, it's like everything becomes relative. You know, nothing is really true or false. And one of the things about coming into Islam, and then I have to do this, I cannot do that, you know, is that it puts parameters in your being that give you a tertib rabbani. It gives you a lordly organization of the self, and then you can relate to things like the necessary, the possible, and the impossible. And then also we can distinguish between what is gurur and what is not gurur. And for many people in the West, this is a big problem, this question that was asked right here. Many people, a lot, a lot, a lot of them, they say that in the United States, that one out of every four persons is insane. I would be la. I mean, and you know, you saw this murder of the kindergarten just a short time. This, when my wife, my wife came to the Gambia for our 40th anniversary, which was really beautiful. You know, she, one of the first things that she asked in the Gambia was for a particular man to pray for her because her heart was bleeding because of these children. This my wife's a teacher. She said, I cannot get these children out of my mind. And I can't, how can this happen? This is insane. What has happened? What has happened? But this is the price that we pay. You know, I mean, I mean even, you know, we could talk about that at great length. I mean, look at what's happening in India today. You know, gang rapes and things like this. This is, this is unthinkable in India a hundred years ago. And I think that I'm right when I say that. You may, some of you would know more than I, but like basically the Indians are very decent people, whether they are Muslims or Hindus, and they honor women. This is all Bollywood. It's all the garbage, you know, that they're being shown on movies and things like that in the music, and now it's everything is coming apart. This is what happens, you know. These are what in Christian vocabulary we call the wages of sin, the price you have to pay for this. You know, but for a lot of people, you know, the distinction, especially people who don't live in the parameters, the difference between illusion and truth is not there. It's just a relative thing. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why you have a lot of insanity in the United States, because for many people, it's like, what is insanity? It's like, whatever I want to do is right. You know, whatever I'm compelled to do. And insanity is basically your judgment of me, that's all. That, and maybe after I get, I get to a point where I don't care what you say. I don't care what anybody says. Then people can do terrible things. Uh, we had a sister in Chicago who's, um, you know, um, I, I teach her, you know, mashallah, I think a lot of her. She's a, I think very highly of her. You know, she was going to her apartment in Chicago, downtown, and a man jumped out of his apartment to commit suicide and hit the pavement right in front of her. I mean, can you imagine what the effect of that was on her? You know, it's, but it's like, what is wrong? What is wrong? And, uh, you know, we, we have a great obligation to be able to bring this prophetic message to the attention of people. And we have to embody it in a beautiful way. But uh, the American people, and I'm an American, um, and my family's been in America for a long time, 
You know, I don't, I love the American people. They are my own people. But they need to have this teaching. They need to have it. Desperately. You know, I used to feel 40 years ago when I first came into Islam, looking at people like my cousins, you know, whom I love very much, like they would be such good Muslims. I know they would be. You know, they would be so good. You know, but at that time it's just like, if only we could reach them. Today it's like, we've got to reach them. You know, they're on drugs, committing suicide. You know, it's, it's like everything is coming apart. Um, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned that Allah's attributes are infinite. Are His names and our knowledge of Him, as our names, as His names, I'm sorry, and our knowledge of Him. Does anything we link to Allah become infinite by default? Now that's a really good question. That's a very, very good question. And I know who wrote it. <laughs> you know, mashallah. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, first of all, you know, the knowledge, the, the, the attributes... Okay, yeah. So he says, you mentioned that Allah's attributes are infinite. And you mentioned that His names are infinite. And you mentioned our, na- our knowledge of Him is also infinite. Does anything we link to Allah become infinite by default? Very good question. Uh, there's only one mistake here. And that is that our knowledge of Allah is potentially infinite. But it's not infinite right now. But you have to build that knowledge on the strong, on the sound foundation. You have to have the right basis. And then you begin to get knowledge of God. And that's the whole purpose of the aqidah, is to worship Allah. And, and he says, "Aqulu hada hamdan lillah, la aqulu hada ta'aliman, wa in kana ta'alim wajiban, lakin aqulu hamdan." You know, I do this as an act of worship. Okay, so in the end, you know, you know, la ilma, la amal bila ilm. There is no sound practice without knowledge. Wa la ilma bila amal, and there is no knowledge without practice. Don't ever forget that. That's a cognitive frame. And that's a cognitive frame that is absolutely true. And it opens up the universe. I cannot do anything. I cannot practice correctly if I don't have knowledge. You know, how can I make hajj if I don't know how to make hajj? I don't know about wudu. I don't know about ghusl. I don't know about ihram. I don't know about miqat. Not possible, right? I have to know these things. Then I can do the amal. La amal bila ilm. Wa la ilm bila amal. There is no knowledge without practice. You know, so when we get the knowledge, we have to do it. And the Sahaba, radhwanallahi alayhim, when they would memorize a verse of the Quran, they would try to understand what is its hukum? What is the amal that it implies? And then they would do that first, then they take the next verse. Okay, may Allah enable us to do that. If we study this knowledge just as beautiful ideas, and I hope you'll find that they're beautiful ideas, and beautiful expressions, but we don't practice it, we don't incorporate it into our life, then it goes away. One of our great shaykhs, he said that when the ma'na first comes to you, it comes like a mountain. He says that when the ma'na, he means by that the understanding of the meaning, right? When it first comes to you, it comes like a mountain. And he says, if you take it, it will always be a mountain. If you don't, it'll go away. And then you forget, oh, that was nothing. Oh, yeah, I remember it was kind of exciting. Okay? Then it maybe comes back. When it comes back, he said it comes back, kathawr, comes back like an ox. He says, then maybe you can get it, maybe you can have it. If you don't, it'll go away. When it comes back, it comes back like a cat. Cats are not easy to get if they're not your cat. Even if it's your cat, it's not easy to get. Right? And then, if you get it, you've got it. And, and then if it goes away, maybe it never comes back again. Or if it comes back, it comes back like a little bird. And how are you going to get the little bird? So, 
you know, when we know the truth, we have to do it. May Allah enable us to do that. That is a very big order. That's very difficult. But, you know, we have to have that intention. We have to, and then the knowledge becomes real. The knowledge becomes Man amila bima alima awrathahullahu ilma ma lam yakun ya'lam. Whoever will practice what he or she knows, God will give them as an inheritance the knowledge they did not know. And our history of Islam is filled with people who only took a basic text like this, but they practiced it and they became great human beings and filled with light and they guided thousands of people. And the whole secret is just that they practiced what they learned. They practice what they learn. So may Allah enable us to do that. So what we're doing in theology is to get the knowledge that enables us to do the practice. And when we do the practice, then the knowledge grows and grows and grows. And it grows in this world and in the next world. May Allah make us all of the people of the Jannah. May He bring us all together in Firdaus. Okay? And there you see beauty like you never imagined. And you come to a knowledge of Allah that is beyond expression. Okay? But it's all in accordance to what we had here. And it grows and grows and grows and grows. It's infinite, but it's potentially infinite. Okay? When we talk about the infinite, we talk about actual infinites and potential infinites. So whenever we talk about an infinite that is about the created world, we're only talking about a potential infinite. Because there cannot exist an infinite set of temporal things. Mathematics knows it. When they study about infinity in mathematics, they also know that even though we can talk about an infinite set, but it does not exist. It does not exist in the real world. Okay? Um, but when we talk about God, we are talking about infinitudes. Infinite names, infinite attributes. And this is something that is beyond our full comprehension. But what we say of God, as the brother says here, um, does anything we link to Allah become infinite uh, by default? Um, you know, God is necessary being, and He is infinite being. And we'll talk about that tomorrow, bi um, You know, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. And um, it goes actually beyond aqidah. It goes very much beyond that. But multiplicity, which is the characteristic of creation, is a manifestation of the oneness of God. So inshallah we'll talk about that maybe. If you're able to come, maybe you'll get an answer that's, that's uh, acceptable to you. Bismillah. Uh, going back to the pen topic. Da -da -da -da. My pen. Uh, does the pen I am using now derive its penness from the original pen created by Allah at the beginning of time? So that's also a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, in Aqidah we don't talk about things like that. Because those are not things that are qat'i. They are not things that are definitive. And in the Aqidah we only talk about things that are definitive. That's why the aqidah is the base. But um, this pen has penness. We call it a pen. We recognize it as such. It has attributes that keep it within that realm. Um, does it reflect the original pen? Uh, that's another question. And um, outside the realm of aqidah, we could say yes. Because of the fact that there is the world of archetypes, of, of amthal, Many great scholars, great scholars, I don't know any exceptions to that. They talk about the Alam al Amthal, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyyah, you can, many of them they talk about that. You know, so the Alam al Amthal is the world of spiritual realities and of archetypes. And uh, the pen falls into an archetype that we would say gives it penness. Again, this is not part of our creed, so you don't have to believe this. Not necessary. 
It's about the structure of reality, and that's itself really, really interesting. Um, in the 19th century, one of the things we want to talk about is evolution. That will come a little bit later. Uh, I want to talk about that really carefully, bi ta'ala. But, <clears throat> you know, in the, and when you talk about science, it's always necessary to talk about the history of science. You, you, this is really important. You want to talk about anything, nuclear physics, atomic physics, um, botany, zoology, you've got to talk about the history of science. So when we go back to the 19th century, which is the century when the talk about evolution became the big thing. You know, and in the 19th century, a lot of people are talking about evolution. And you have one basic school of evolution, which is creative evolution. The greatest scientists of the 19th century, like Agassiz and uh, Cuvier, they all believe in creative evolution. And they understand the same things Darwin understands better than Darwin. He was not their peer. They were much bigger scientists, but they talk about creative evolution. That this cannot be by chance. These are really important things. And in 19th century biology, which today probably no one takes seriously, in 19th century biology, what were the biologists fundamentally concerned with? Do any of you know? Have you studied that? A 19th century biologist, let's say in 1850, and don't think that they were stupid in 1850. They were discovering dinosaurs and everything else. Cuvier knew all about the dinosaurs. Cuvier was, an, he was the greatest biologist of the late 18th and early 19th century. Amazing. Cuvier, and Cuvier said that, you know, you talk, he said, evolution, species. He said, there's no question about that. We have dinosaurs, we have fossils, we have all these things. He is the one who studied that. But he said, let me tell you something about the skeleton. Cuvier has beautiful terms for this, which I don't remember right now. But it's about the organic structure of the body. Cuvier was a master of anatomy. My, my father also was an anatomist. My grandfather also were anatomists. They were big anatomists. They love bones. You give them any bone, they will tell you what it is, where it belongs, where the structure of the animal is. Cuvier was like that too. Cuvier said, you give me any femur, any bone, and I can tell you whether it was a carnivore, whether it was a herbivore, whether it was an omnivore, and I can even structure it. I can put it back together. I might be a little bit off, but I won't be really far off. I mean, most of our dinosaur knowledge is on that basis that we just get one bone or two bones, but we can put the thing together. And this is because there is a harmony between one part of that body and its bone structure, its ligament structure, and the whole body. You know, so Cuvier said, if you're going to change anything, and the person he's talking about is not Darwin, he's before Darwin, he's talking about Lamarck. And Lamarck was a madman, really stupid ideas. You know, that just the giraffe extends its head and so it gets a longer head. And then it gives it to its baby. So you get your giraffes. I mean, really, Cuvier said, I should dismiss you from the department for this idiocy. But he didn't. He had mercy on Lamarck. But, you know, Cuvier said, you change anything in the structure of any animal, everything else has got to change. It's just like today you have certain computer programs, right, where you want to make a certain change in an object or an image or a design, and then the whole thing will restructure, right? The whole program will restructure itself to take in that combination. So Cuvier said, all living things are this way. Therefore, you cannot have partial change like that. This would be extinction. Agassiz says the same thing. Agassiz was a great scientist. He was a great Swiss scientist. He says the same thing. These people... You know, they opposed Darwinian theory on scientific evidence. And we don't hear about that very much. You see, because, again, we hear that, well, the church was talking about the Bible and things like that, and, you know, how could we be from monkeys, and everybody laughs, and then Huxley gets up and makes this really strong argument. That's not what happened historically. Historically, this was a debate between taxonomists and between biologists, and, and, and others. And they had very strong arguments, which they still have to this day, such as the distinctive nature of every species, 
that species are distinctive, and you never see a, a species go to another one. Yes? Hmm? A taxonomist. What is a taxonomist? Darwin was a taxonomist. What is a taxonomist? Right. So the taxonomist is the one who knows kingdoms and phylums and species and so forth. And then he'll tell you that this animal belongs to this species, this family, this phylum, this kingdom, right? That's a taxonomist. It's a beautiful science. And the 18th century developed taxonomy with a theology of taxonomy you know, Linnaeus and others, and they believe that these species reflect archetypes. And that is, for me, true, based on my answer to this question. Again, this is not something that we insist on as an Islamic belief, but we can get a lot of mileage out of that. It's very, very important. So, um, what the biologists of the 19th century is concerned with is the archetypes. And this would sound so funny to many people today, but to me it's not. To me it's very respectable. So what is the archetypical mollusk? What is the archetypical horse? What is the archetypical wolf? What is the archetypical pine tree? And they're believing in Amthal. But they're also saying that species reflects the archetypes. And species in all of its variation are different dimensions of that archetype. Now, this is metaphysically significant. This is, for me, real science. But uh, in any case, we'll just leave it there for right now. Um, you stated that in the creation story we have six days and there are six steps in the expanding theory. Can you please explain them? You have to ask Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Okay, he's the one. If you want to ask anything about stars, anything about planets, anything about this... Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. You know, you can go to Zaytuna, you can send him an email, uh, and he'd probably answer that email. He, he gets a thousand emails, but you ask him about that, then you get an answer. But for me, I just know this because he told me. I don't know anything more than that. Hmm, um, let's see. How are we doing with time? Are we okay? Hmm. Okay, so, um, how does change... So, here we have questions about change again. And we talked about that quite a lot. Okay, and um, I think these are pretty good questions. Maybe we can leave these to tomorrow? We, do you think we can do that? Inshallah. And I value your questions. I keep your questions. And I'll write them down later on, inshallah. Because... Oh, you know, uh, I think this is really important knowledge. Um, I want to write a book about this. I've got a manuscript of it called The Knowledge of God's Oneness, Prophets, Prophecy, and the Unseen. It's two volumes. And these questions go into the book. Because like, I have to know what you understood and what you didn't understand. And then that, makes, that enables me to write it in a way that is meaningful to people. Whatever you don't understand, a thousand other people don't understand. So we have to make it clear to you. بإذن الله تعالى اللهم وفقنا لما تحبه وترضاه وجعلنا من عبيدك السعداء وأمتنا على كلمة الهدى علمنا ما ينفعنا ووفقنا للعمل بما علمتنا به وجعل ما نحن فيه خالصا مخلصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين آمين.